who already knows the answer. Nobody had a brilliant thought. That's what happened in Grantville um, and my story, um, which I've been told by, elect by uh, people who work at power plants and who do stepper motor design, Doug Jones. Being you're not in my way, one, so you're fine. That my story is not realistic if because I these guys something wouldn't have the blind spot that I put in the story. But I think yeah. he's wrong because I've talked to guys that work at power plants. Um, so, but here's the um, answer. Before we go on, yeah. um, I want to confirm, Chuck and I were just talking. Um, the aqualator is 1634-5. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I have, so for the Caribbean, I have gunnery computers. Yes, you do. Oh, you said they're on a ship and they ship. Yeah, except, yeah, of course. Except for you can put them in a float. So yes. So gravity can And you can put them on the bolts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can, but and you can. Good problem. Yeah, you're going to have to have a good pressure yeah. regulator, but that's your problem. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so there. So we have this story, which I strongly urge you to take a look at. It's my first, oh, my yeah. first published piece of fiction, which, as I told her, went through 15 major rewrites yeah. before David Carrico finally helped me tweak out some dialogue and got it actually up to publishable. And I will never, ever forgive him for forcing me to write fiction. Oh. Speaking of that, so oh. speaking of that <laughs> how many, how many of you would Philip. like to Father be Philip a published Phil. writer? Oh, Ooh. and you're not. Okay. I'm well, a published writer. For, how did you become a published writer? I sold an, uh, my first my first published piece was at the Grantville Gazette on chocolate. I know a lot about chocolate. Okay. So one of and the I made six hundred and fifty dollars. Hey. One of the things <laughs> that Eric did very early on um, was he got a contract to write uh, to produce an anthology in the sixteen thirty two series, and he called and it was going to be called Ring of Fire. And he came out to those of uh, those of us who were working with him on the series and said, "Why don't you write something?" And People turned in stuff that was really bad and unpublishable, so he decided that Sturgeon's Law yeah. applies. 95% yeah. of everything is crap. crap. Well, yeah. So Eric decided that he would, he would run a writing tutorial, um, and it's uh, and it's still running. It runs actually in two different places uh, because when Eric was the editor of Jim Bain's Universe. He started the same thing. Eric has a real desire to have um, new writers um, get a chance to be published. Be successful. And be successful. So if you want to, the, the way that the Granville Gazette works is even if you are published a lot, um, like Virginia or the rest of us, you still have Another to. Another pros, Brad, sign your yeah, everybody. Everybody posts in the 1632 slush. slush conference your story and it allows the group to do uh, to do crit commentary commentary and if um, if, if it becomes publishable and Paul buys it at professional rates at professional yeah, rates plus qualifying yeah. rates. I understand those are real low because it's a fact of life but they're it's recognized by science it's five cents a word Qualified you CIFWA. Well, how many you of us are CIFWA it. members? Because of, because of the Grantville Gazette. Uh, thing is that we're going to talk about this Sunday. Yeah, we're going to talk about more Sunday. So, so I'm going to go back. To I'm the putting out. I'm putting out a commercial. Commercial. If you want to, so stick around and give me and lights. We'll teach you how. Give me lights for one second, and we're going to flip them twice. So, okay. So this is the answer to the question. How did Reginald Fessenden make the first AM radio broadcast? He made it really this big. This is not his first draft, okay? <laughs> this is the last remaining Alexanderson alternator in the world. It is operated by the government of Sweden. It is an international UN historical site. And it is operated on special occasions, like the, like the anniversary of the... Radio. Um, of the first AM radio broadcast, uh, Alexanderson Day, they call it, and other special occasions. 
And so, but you can hear it if you tune to the right frequency when they broadcast. You can even hear it in the US. It's amazing. But uh, it is an alternator. It is a mechanical AM transmitter. There is no electronics in here. What there is, is there's a big steel disc. Big steel disc. They put holes around the edge of the big steel disc. They put magnets lined up around the outside, right? A, with an electromagnet on one side and a coil on the other. When the hole lines up, the magnetism goes through. When the hole doesn't line up, the magnetism can't get through because the steel closes the circuit, right? I am massively oversimplifying. <laughs> Good because it would I did be beyond me if you did. Right, absolutely. But do you see? Instead of having coils and wires and all sorts of fancy things spinning, what we have spinning is just the steel the a core. big heavy steel disc. The coils just sit there. They don't do anything. Okay? So there's it's no magnetic relaxation. So there's no metal fatigue right. on the wires or the coils or the... You don't, actually, you just embed them. Right, right because they don't move. They don't move. But the point is, you can make radio transmissions then using nothing but a mechanical transmitter. Okay? Now, that just gives you the basic carrier. It's silent at that point, right? You tuned in the AM station and there's nothing there. You haven't broadcast the, yet. I haven't, broadcast, I haven't got any, any content yet. The very first thing that Fessenden did, his first broadcast, which was heard by 17 radio operators and logged by 17 different people, who were sitting in ships and, uh, and a shore operator who logged every transmission they heard. They were listening for Morse code, right, from other ships and stuff. And so we have the logs, they exist. And so that first transmission was heard by 17 of them, right? And they went, what the hell is that? <laughs> because of course, instead of did it da did it. Instead of click 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 click, they heard, they heard, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. This is Reginald Fessenden transmitting from Black Rock. Okay, and so they were going. So so. They were having fatal heart attacks. <laughs> but. But Fessenden did the simplest way to modulate the signal he could come up with. Y'all know what a carbon microphone is? It used to be in every telephone in the world. Mm -hmm. You take carbon grains between two pieces of metal, and when you squeeze them, the resistance goes down, and when they're not squeezed, the resistance goes up. So you talk at the piece of metal, and it vibrates, right? It squeezes the carbon grains, and your electrical resistance goes up and down. Well, Fessenden took six carbon microphones, arranged them in a circle, ran the signal through all six of them, and then stood up. And so he's got his AM radio power running through this wire out to his antenna. And he gets close enough to the wire to shout into the microphones without getting so close that he grounded himself. Tell him how much power. Huh? Tell him how much power. Oh, well, his initial transmitter was only 5,000 watts. So you are putting your lips half an inch away from a 5,000 watt bare wire. Right. Right, now think about that for a minute. <laughs> think about a hundred watt And if you have a must, say it. Don't don't think about a hundred watt <laughs> So, in the early days of mechanical radio, being a radio broadcast personality was <coughs> exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, especially if you had a mustache, right? <laughs> Not knowing this happened, because somebody would come in to clean up the carbon pile on the ground, not knowing what was going on. The <laughs> there you go. You make more um, carbon that way. So, so <laughs> exactly. So, um, so very quickly they came up with another way to modulate it. Okay. It turns out that you can modulate it using a transformer, and you can put a control signal into one side of a transformer and put the AM broadcast through another, and you can modulate it. It's crappy sound compared to what we have now. But it's utterly amazing sound compared to never having heard radio. Okay. Yeah. Did it? Did it? Good Merry enough? Christmas. Well, the <laughs> standard for good enough for this kind of crude technology is: can you recognize the musical instrument being played? 
And the answer is yes. Okay, so the voice of Luther goes on the air in 1635. Yeah. In 16, I think. Yeah. That's about right. VOL goes on the air in about 1635, running a modified downtime built Alexanderson alternator with a magnetic modulator. The it's fact that it was again custom built radio tower. The fact that it was in invented by a Swede didn't hurt the process. The fact that it was invented by a Swede didn't hurt anything, no. <laughs> but the um, so the story of the discovery of this technology and how it came into being in Grantville is in a story called Canst Thou Send Lightnings, in which a character, Father Nicholas Smithson, realizes that the reason they weren't able to build the alternator was they were trying to spin up alternators and they didn't think of the um, idea of just letting it sit there and spinning the disc and at the end of the story we so desperately wanted to take the opposite of Galileo's last words you know Galileo's yeah. last words but it doesn't work. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah Galileo's last words were but it moves okay so what we wanted as the final phrase in the story was, but it doesn't move. <laughs> it just sets there. So we, we couldn't do it. it did, we couldn't make it work. And so we took that out, and David had the, the absolutely perfect phrase for the end. We said earlier, in the you know, paragraph earlier, that the idea, the perfect, you know, that this was something that grant fillers were never going to think of because their personality, their culture, the American way, was to just do something. They needed to think about it. They needed, because their personality, they were never gonna think of just letting it sit there. It just wasn't part of their culture, right? And so Nick Smithson writes a book on interpreting downtime, uptime technology and uptime sources for downtime audiences. How to read how, the exegesis of uptime texts right which he entitles how not to think like a redneck <laughs> <laughs> and it becomes one of the best selling books in europe right so how big is that huh how big is that how big is that, that? object oh that object um so, these are about six inches which are the brass gauges okay Oh, it's this is so you about eight feet in diameter. You standing remember, next to it. This was yeah. the last generation. Okay, so this thing is, as I recall, and I, I we can look them up. But this thing is a hundred. It's either 150 or 175 thousand watts. Yeah. Okay, you don't need this kind of power. Mass. Huge. Huge. Heavy. Uh, yeah. Steam engine mass. Okay. Yeah. And you've got to have a steam engine to power. Uh, yeah, the, or, the original models, do you have any notion of the of yeah, size um, mass? Yeah, three to tall. four feet in diameter and um, powered by an electric motor powered by a steam generator because you wanted the, the volt, you wanted the, 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 the frequency to stay still so you used a read right. to control the, anyway, um, so three to four feet in diameter ton mass would be a ton, a ton and a half um, for the whole thing. Um, yeah, you can put it maybe on the ship. Uh, the Jesuits go on the air in Loyola of the North. Roughly the same time. Yeah, six, late 35, uh, early 36. Where is that? That's, a, is the That's in New York. Within, Within, I'm Within, sorry, Virginia. Where is that located again? Minster. Huh? Minster. Oh, Minster. 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 Minster.